Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Signature Series. From musicians to painters, from novelists to filmmakers, we're bringing you diverse range of voices and perspectives, all united by their passion for their craft. Now we are heading back to the most recent Calgary Expo, where we met with guests from across the entertainment industry who are all connected by their passion for their craft. Today's guest is actor George Buza. George has made a name for himself in the entertainment industry. Although he hails originally from Cleveland, United States, he has spent formative years in Canada and eventually became a proud Canadian in 1998. His most notable role is leading the voice to the character of Beast in the beloved 1990s X-Men cartoon, and he has since reprised his role in X-Men 97. Additionally, he has made a memorable appearance as a truck driver in the first live-action X-Men adaptation, but not limited to those roles. He has also taken on the role of Santa in the chilling film A Christmas Horror Story. This is Cross Border Interviews Signature Series featuring George Buza. George, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start... Basically, last day of Calgary Expo 2024, how do you feel and what are you hearing from the fans about the return of X-Men? They are all as excited as we were to go back and uh, they really love the show and uh, we love it as well. We were kind of concerned about what tack it would take, whether it would pick up the exact flavor that we had in the 90s and I think they've outdone themselves. Even the fans have said that it's even better than it was in the 90s. I mean, not just the quality of the animation, but the quality of the writing was uh, just as good, if not better, than what it was before. So we're all very, very pleased with where it's at. You talk about the return and the, the caution that some people may have. Oh, we got a pop here coming in your way. <laughs> if you need to pop it open, go for it. But you talk about the caution about potentially coming back and bringing back fan favorites. I, uh, we had the pleasure of talking to uh, Julie and Eric from the original, the original creators of X-Men. When you decided to come back, was it a quick yes, let's do it? Or was it a slow and steady burn to say, okay, let's see who else returns before I actually sign on? Well, there was no question that we wanted to sign on because when Julia and Eric released their book, they stayed, got us all together for a, uh, a Comic-Con as an X-Men reunion, and that topic was discussed there, that wouldn't it be nice if we were able to reprise our roles and they bring the series back? And they were said that they were already lobbying with Marvel to do this and Disney, and uh, so we were kind of hoping that it would happen. There was no question that... Absolutely everybody was going to sign on to whatever was given. and We were just hoping we'd get our original roles back. <laughs> and you did get your original role, and people are syn you're synonymous with the role of Hank McCoy now, Beast. Do you get a sense that when you come here, that's what people are asking for is, let's hear Beast, let's talk to Beast? Or do you get a, ra ra a gambit of people asking you about different genres that you've done and different roles that you've participated in? I'm getting a, a wide range of stuff. There was a fella yesterday that came by with a uh, DVD, A Fast Company, which is a David Cronenberg film I did in 1978 up in Edmonton. And I was really surprised to see it. I mean, holy mackerel, where did you find that? And uh, other people are fans of Sinbad and others are fans of other shows that I've done. And uh, I signed a bunch of Beyblade covers so, I mean, I've had a 54-year-long career. And I always bring stuff from other things because you never know what the fans will like. So I want to talk about that career, if you don't mind, for a second, because the industry has changed dramatically from when you first started to where we are here in 2024. We're seeing the rise of AI with voice generation, but people are still clamoring for the original. In your opinion, have you seen it change as dramatically as other people have being someone who has been on the inside and been watching this, this transformative, transformative entertainment industry to where it is to in 2024? Well, from when I started in 1971, it has changed unbelievably. I mean, for one thing, uh, I remember when they introduced casting agents into the voice media. It used to be that you had a, a demo tape and it just went around to all the different agencies and the, they would pick and choose the announcers that they liked. We would always audition for roles in uh, animation, but that middleman, the casting director, I mean, that was one of the innovations that uh, I experienced and got used to. 
I find that AI is a, a major threat to every actor's career because all they need is a tiny little sample of you and you become redundant. So yeah, that's changed. And then with the pandemic, now we don't even have the social gatherings of auditions where all the old announcers and voiceover guys would get together. And it didn't really matter who got the part. There was a, an event where you could get together with people and then you go for coffee. So that's gone. Yeah, it's, the business has changed. And now there's this huge uh, push to go non-union. When I was originally getting into the business, that was like the golden fleece, you know, you were, you wanted to become a union member, otherwise you didn't work. And now that seems to be a liability where in Toronto, the actual members have been locked out for two years from some of the major Canadian corporations in their advertising. I don't want to name any names, but it's, uh, it's really uh, depressing to think that your own national corporations would turn their backs on, on their talent because they're cheap. <laughs> you're, you're, you're talking to two union guys here the, yourself, so you're, speak, you're preaching to the choir. Uh, Anybody that's listening, too. <laughs> so the, the question is, because unions have safeguarded a lot of work for voice actors like yourself, and can the Canadian industry, as you just said, has locked sort of everyone out for the last two years. Do you see it? getting better or <laughs> to, the, to use the age old adage it gets better but well, in your opinion will it get better the only way it will get better is if there is an actual effect of the boycotts that we've asked for uh, for these companies that are refusing to go because we're all gig workers you know we don't have jobs that go nine to five 365 days a year you know you get a job and you might not get another job for several months so that work has to last you until you get another gig and also the pensions, they don't want to pay into the pensions. Now here I'm starting to preach union stuff, but you know, I just retired from doing on-camera work and things and my pension kicked in this year. Now without that, you know, I'd be kind of lost. And I know a lot of actors that had to use their pensions as bank accounts when they couldn't pay their rent or buy groceries. And so they've depleted them and they have no pensions. So they're living off of just what they put into the CPP and their old age. What role does the fan base have in playing in sort of working with actors, voice actors like yourself to sort of address this with the big uh, top executives in Toronto or in Vancouver? Well, the only effect that you can have is if you start boycotting their products. But the, the fan base has always been very much with us. I mean, they, they understand. I mean, without the fans, we wouldn't have careers. They are the driving force of our lives and our careers because if if they don't watch our shows then we don't have work we won't get to the next gig because you're only as good as the one job you did just before so my last question is we're still in season one of x-men 97 it's going to be wrapping up here soon season two season three what else is on the agenda for yourself are you go, are you still looking for work or are you are you just taking the re early retirement and just relaxing really? It's not early retirement. I'm in my 70s, so I just uh, it was a decision that uh, I really didn't want to spend 16 hours a day on a movie set anymore. I will still do voice work and I still audition for it, but to uh, go out and bear the elements and sit out there and freeze in 20 below zero, those days are gone. So what's next for yourself then besides X-Men 97? We just wrapped up season two. Uh, I recorded my last session last week, and I hope and I think they're going to have a season three. I know they've commissioned the writing for it, so I'm quite content to do this. And I also got a recurring role on uh, a little kid's animation series called Eleanor Wonders Why. It's a little rabbits, and I play Grandpa Rabbit. And I love that. I love doing little kids' cartoons. My nephew is going to be extremely happy. <laughs> um, you talked about it. I, I'm, I'm assuming I might be getting the wrap up here. I'm not 100% sure. Get. So, so, you spent two years here in Calgary. How does it feel to be back in Calgary? But also, has it changed dramatically compared when you first were here to where you are now? Yes, it has. Well, there's a lot more building going on. A lot of the buildings that I used to look at were no longer there. A lot of the shops I used to go to are no longer there. I understand that even uh, the little mall down by the river I used to go to is on its way out. So a lot of them, it's been 
25 years. So things do change. I mean, I remember when I first moved to Toronto, it was a city of 750,000 people. And now it's over 4 million. And it's nothing but construction cranes and gridlock. And if you drive on the QEW, it just bumper to bumper for <laughs> like a good two hours. What QEW? They just closed the, the for three years. They've uh, taken a, a lane off each direction. So not only was it already narrow and crowded, it's going to be even worse now because they're revamping the whole thing. It's crumbling. And they've torn down everything east of Jarvis Street. There's no QEW that goes all the way to the East End anymore. It stops at downtown and goes directly into the Don Valley Parkway or down to the Lakeshore Boulevard. And to get on it, you have to go all the way up to, the, to Bayview. It's, Toronto's got the worst traffic in North America. You know, that's our, our badge of honor. It's Even Tom Cruise. He's like, what is going on here? <laughs> George, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to chat with someone of your caliber, and it's an honor to have you on the show. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me back. It's great to be back in Calgary. We want to thank Calgary Expo for inviting us and having us for this four-day conference in downtown, beautiful downtown Calgary. This show could not have happened without their support. Now, if you've enjoyed this show and you want to keep up on all the latest signature series that we have coming to you, hit that subscribe button now. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.